If you've spent any time following the Chargers, Rams, or Raiders in the last couple of years, you're probably pretty frustrated with the games that sports franchises and multi-billionaire owners have been playing with loyal, supportive fans for decades. Threatening to pack up and leave. The reasons are often varied. The moving of teams is more commonplace among less established teams, but it still happens in large markets as well. The reasons? Well, commonly they're motivated by either problems with finances, inadequate facilities, or lack of support, or even sometimes just the wishes of the owner or owners. In most cases, however, it's usually a combination of all of these problems. This eventually leads to an all too common trend, the haves imposing on said cities enormous taxes for the near bankrupt municipalities to take out huge loans and to fork over hundreds of millions of dollars in order to build glitzy new arenas or else the teams are going to leave for greener pastures. But who's to blame? The NFL? The city? County? Do outside groups like the Lot and Pete Collective really have a chance in this big business? And what happens to the fans that so fervently follow their teams on Sundays? That's our subject for tonight. This is the Will to Win. Thing that would burn brightest here is the will to win. Is the will to win. Is the will to win. Your commitment to excellence and your will to win will endure forever. You will magnificent. Hey! Let's go, boys. Let's go to do our thing now. The autumn wind is a pirate. Clark feeling pressure in front of him. Has his man. It's Cooper. Cooper inside the 10. Into the end zone for the Raiders. Touchdown. We're going to challenge you from the neck up this afternoon. Eric Target a lot for the end zone for Roberts. He's got it. Touchdown! Oh, in the first five to ten plays of the game, the other team's quarterback must go down. And he must go down hard. Sacked from behind by Khalil Mack. Hello, I'm Raider Pirate. Welcome to the Will to Win broadcast coming to you live from our Los Angeles and Fresno studios. As always, we'll be breaking down our show into three individual segments. A cue and answer where the Raider Nation submits their questions to the Oakland Knight. A state of the Raiders where we discuss relevant topics that could affect the team, the fan base, or football in general. And a draft biography where we look at rookies that we agree will have an impact in some fashion this year. Tonight's State of the Raiders Stadium Edition will include a special guest of the show, so we hope you enjoy that. I'm joined by the usual suspects. They're excited to answer your questions that you want to know. Once again, this is only our opinion, but we're uniquely qualified to give you just that, our opinions. Let's meet our analysts, shall we? The Oakland Knight is a co-founder and senior analyst of the Will to Win. The Raider Lion is our senior international analyst from the United Kingdom and our resident draft expert. Welcome to both of you gentlemen. Let's begin with our first segment, shall we? The Raider Nation has been kind enough to send us questions via text and email. If you would like to submit a question, you can reach us via email at the W2W at gmail.com. Our first question tonight comes from Phantasma983. He writes, With both captains from last year's team retired, who do you guys think should be our next captain? This is Raider Gus from Fayetteville, Arkansas. Knight? With all the changes that we have made this offseason by losing guys like Justin Tuck and Charles Woodson, I left a void in who's going to be our defensive captains. In my opinion, I believe that Khalil Mack would be an obvious choice as he's one of our most, if not our most, dominant player on that side of the ball. However, Khalil Mack is one to use his actions more than his words. So that left me to believe that guys like Malcolm Smith, Bruce Irvin, 
and Sean Smith would be perfect fits for captains on our defense. They both, or all three I should say, have incredible experience on winning football teams, playoff experience, and two of them even have Super Bowl experience, Super Bowl championship winning experience. They know Ken Norton's system. They know what to expect, not only from Ken Norton, but they know where people should be lined up and where they should play. So in my honest opinion, I believe that Malcolm Smith, Bruce Irvin, and even a guy like Sean Smith have the best optimum chance to be our captains on defense. Yeah, and let's not forget about guys like Dan Williams. I mean, Knight, this is a pretty young football team. If we look from the secondary to the linebacking core to the defensive line, since we are just talking about the defensive side of the football, it's a pretty young team. We had some great, great veterans that were able to coach up uh, some of our guys. Now, what do you think about that? I mean, you know, we had a really, really, really young sort of green team. It had these great veterans, uh, you know, Super Bowl winning guys that had good work ethics. And they were able to impart that to these younger players. Now you've sort of got this mixture of guys that are going to start, you know, sowing their own oats, um, but also a strong group of veterans. How, how do you think that that molding is going to take place? Well, I do believe it's a testament once again to what Reggie McKenzie has been able to do with this football team. In this offseason, he brought in Bruce Irvin, Sean Smith, and guys like Reggie Nelson. It's a variety of young and older players that have great experience on winning football teams. So as young as we are on both sides of the ball, he's not necessarily throwing all the pressure on the really young guys. There's guys that are seasoned now, even four years in the league, Malcolm Smith, Bruce Irvin, and you can mix those guys up with Sean Smith and Reggie Nelson, who've been in the league for eight years plus, and now you've got a great combination of youth and about sophomore type style players and then old veterans. I think it's a perfect combination of what a team needs to succeed, especially as young as we are. So it's just going to help propel the young ones forward in a few years, and they will soon be a part of or shall we say, take over guys like Bruce Irvin, Malcolm Smith, Khalil Mack. Those are going to be the guys that we look towards for the future. But right now, we can lean on guys like Malcolm Smith and Bruce Irvin and mix it up with guys like Sean Smith and Reggie Nelson. And I believe that could cause great chemistry moving forward and of leadership and, and playing experience and lining people up in the right places. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's key. I think chemistry is going to be key in how quickly this team develops. Well, our next question uh, is a stadium question. RJ writes, Raider RJ here, do you think that Mark Davis would consider selling part of the Raiders if we were inches away from getting a deal done on a new stadium? Knight? Well, I do believe that Mark Davis already understands that he's going to have to sell some of the his shares to the team to even stay in Oakland or move to a place even like Las Vegas. A lot of reports have stated the fact that maybe he should sell or that he's going to sell, but there's plenty of evidence out there now to show that whether he stays in Oakland and he needs to sell some of his shares to make up the difference for what he needs to pay to have a stadium in Oakland, or if he needs to sell some of his shares to have the money to move his franchise to a place like Las Vegas. Moving a team is not as simple as packing up a U-Haul and hitting the road. There's a lot that's involved. You gotta help your team relocate. You have to move your practice facilities. And the NFL is gonna be looking for a fee themselves that could range up to $500 million. Now, even though he doesn't have to pay that all in one year or at one time, it's still a really large added expense to what already is a struggling financial franchise in the way that it's marketed today. So in order for him to have the money to stay or move, it's looking like he has no choice but to sell some of his team. The question really is, I guess, is how much? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. I mean, we saw that um, he was willing to sell the team to Iger if they could get some type of a deal done uh, for the Carson project. So uh, I think we know that he's prepared to do it. I think the question is, would he sell the team outright? In my opinion, I, I don't think that he would, but I don't know. What do you think, Knight? All signs have pointed to the fact that there's no way Mark Davis is going to just give up his whole team to anybody. Not to Ronnie Lott and his investors, not to Jerry Jones and a partner that maybe he has in mind to take over the franchise. Mark Davis has grown to love not only the Raiders, but the Raider Nation. And I know a lot of people kind of question his love because of the way that he's handling certain situations. But that's what we're kind of here to talk about on The Wheel to Win is why and what and what to look forward to. So I wouldn't judge Mark Davis just from the certain things that have been happening lately. I believe that Mark Davis loves the franchise and more importantly, I believe that he loves the Raider Nation. Absolutely. Let's not forget that this is business and when it comes down to it, you have to be able to compete. Otherwise, you're going to stay in the position that you are. So I think Mark Davis is doing the best that he can with what he has, but I think he, he knows that, that he needs more. Well, our next question comes from Raider J. Hey guys, Raider J here from Sacramento. I really don't know much about how the salary cap works, but in two or three years, are we going to have enough money to re-sign Mac, Carr, and Cooper? Because by my estimation, that's at least $300 million in contracts. What are your guys' thoughts? Ooh, that's a tough one, Knight. Well, that is a tough one. When you look at the team and how it's structured, and now that we spent a, quite a bit of money in this offseason, it leaves you to wonder, well, how are we going to pay for guys like Khalil Mack, Amari Cooper, and Derek Carr? Once again, I'm going to mention the brilliance of Reggie McKenzie. Reggie has been a master of constructing contracts that fit the team's needs. They're all front-loaded, so we're not guaranteeing money in the back end of contracts. So players are easily moved whether it's to another team or off the roster in general, which will always allow us to have money freed up for our future. The way that the contracts are set up now, Reggie McKenzie will have the opportunity to get rid of some of the older players and pay some of the newer players like Khalil Mack and Derek Carr that will be coming up sooner rather than later. I like the fact that Reggie has made contracts like Reggie Nelson's, Sean Smith's, Dan Williams, Michael Crabtree, all just to say a few, front-loaded. What this will allow is for Reggie McKenzie to move money as well as we're going to get added money every year to the salary cap. All these things combined is going to allow him to give guys like Khalil Mack and Derek Carr huge contracts that I'm sure he's going to try to front-load as well. But even more importantly, this just puts more of an emphasis on Reggie McKenzie's ability to seek talent in the draft because we're going to have to rotate players out such as the Seth Roberts, some of the linebackers that we have, Dan Williams, Justin Jelly Ellis. These are some of the casualties of war, but this is where we're going, guys. I mean, you take a young team, eventually that young team becomes talented and then you have tough decisions to make. That's how we ended up getting guys like Kaleche Osemele, Bruce Irvin, Malcolm Smith, etc. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think that it's important to note that we're not in the same situation as Denver is. Denver was an entirely different situation. Uh, they were very close. They, they knew that they were a couple of players away. They went out and they spent the big money on Peyton Manning. I mean, they were in a, a sweepstake with everybody else in the league for, at the time, what was the best quarterback around. So, obviously, they spent a lot of money there. They spent a lot of money on Aqib Tlaib, guys like DeMarcus Ware. So, they went out with a team that was already mature, that was already near the cap, and they went to the minimum. I, I'm sorry, the maximum. So, we're we're in such a different state. We're a team that's up and coming. Reggie McKenzie is making some really good decisions here. He's making sure the, the like like you said, Knight, these are prove it contracts, which means, hey, you know what? I want to sign you for low. You show me that you can be valuable to this team. You show me that you can be good in the locker room, and I'll go on ahead and I'll extend you. 
uh, as we move into the future. So again, at this point, uh, really, you're going to be giving money to Khalil Mack. That's the that's the only guy right now that we can say, hey, this guy, regardless, is going to need a, a huge contract. We don't know if Derek Carr by that time is going to be Peyton Manning style or or if Amari Cooper is going to turn into a Randy Moss or a Jerry Rice type of, of wide receiver. I think the writing's on the wall. Khalil Mack is certainly going to be that type of guy, but I think it's a little bit different. So um, do you think, uh, I mean, what, it, uh, even our salary cap situation now, even though we did spend a lot of money this year, we still have a lot of money coming up and the cap is just going to get bigger. So do you think that this team is going to be able to continue to go out there and selectively handpick some, some top name free agents and build through the draft? Or do you think at this point they just reel everything in and just try to do the, you know, New England or uh, Green Bay style of, of now not going out and signing any big names and, and really just focusing primarily through the draft. I believe we finally hit that stage, Pirate, where it's going to be Reggie McKenzie running a Green Bay farm system, meaning he's going to primarily be looking through the draft to build this team and not so much in free agency. Free agency was so important to him now because there was a lot of holes that he needed to fill and go out and get guys like Sean Smith, Malcolm Smith, and Bruce Irving because those guys were bridge gap players. Key components to our team now, but in the long term, he needed to bring some talent into this team to get it to lay the foundation, as he even says. So now that the foundation is laid, you'll see us not focusing so much on the offseason. If there's a player that is a game changer, something that's dynamic, that fits our system and fits what Reggie McKenzie wants to spend, you'll see him do it. But now it's about paying our own and growing our own and coaching our own. And that's one thing that we haven't really seen here ever inside the Raider Nation. So I'm excited to see how Jack Del Rio and Reggie McKenzie finish this journey and keep it going into the future. Yeah, absolutely, partner. I mean, I think, again, every point that you made is correct. I mean, you know, we haven't seen this, and it's and it's an exciting time because we do have a lot of youth that, that's coming up and the contracts are being handled the right way and players want to come here because we've got good coaches. It really is different than, than the last couple of, of decades of, of Raider football. So it is an absolutely exciting time. Well, our last question tonight comes from Raider Rick. He writes, my question is, do you think that Coach Del Rio will be with us beyond his four-year contract? And if so, do they give him an extension after this year or do they wait until his contract is up? I hope he is with us until he decides to retire. Thanks for all you guys do for us Raider fans. Good question. Jack Del Rio, that's, that's one that we haven't touched on so far. Do they go on ahead and take a flyer on him now? Or again, do they do a prove it uh, type of thing and, and go ahead and give him a couple more years? This is an area in which a lot of teams fail at. Either they don't jump on the situation soon enough or they wait too long and then there becomes friction in between coach, GM, or coach, GM, and owner. So in my opinion, when I look at Jack Del Rio and what he's already brought to the table, and if you look at the fact where he's an Oakland native himself, or he's from Hayward anyway, so he's from Alameda County, you make sure that at the first opportunity you can, you have to get this guy under contract extension. Now, he's only going into his second year, so I'm not sweating it at this moment. But for example, if Jack Del Rio continues to make this team grow, which he's shown that he can do and is doing, and we make it to the playoffs this season, and even close to the AFC Championship game, it would probably be wise right there to recognize the talent and what he's done changing the culture and the talent on this football team and getting us to the playoffs and beyond, and you get him a contract right away. If we go, let's say, I don't know, seven and nine again or eight and eight, but you still see more improvement, you see everything starting to come together, then you have the option of waiting another year and you do that. So it's a waiting game at this point. But if you really want to know my opinion personally, all signs are pointing to after this season, a contract extension would not harm me at all. I think he'll earn it. 
Yeah, and I and I think that the debacle in San Francisco is going to work in Jack Del Rio's favor. I mean, again, you know, you spend a long time looking for a coach. You go through all kinds of coaches that aren't the right types of coaches. They can't motivate. They can't lead men. Um, you know, they don't have the it factor. Uh, and then you then you find one. He turns your franchise around, and then you're just going to kind of jettison that guy and try to replace him. I mean, the 49ers right now are, are reeling. They're reeling. So I think that that's going to kind of play in his favor. And and let's not remember. I mean, you, even though like you said, seven and nine, you know, maybe you kind of waited out. Let's not forget. You know, John Gruden. You know, when he came to the Raiders, eight and eight, eight and eight. You know, and then he started to kind of get over the hump. So. Sometimes you got to build. This is a young, young football team. I think that the the guy on the top, like we've talked about before, I, I doubt he's going to be the problem. Um, I think if something does go wrong, it's going to be some of the guys that are that are below him and, and kind of moving guys around to try to try to get the best fit. But this is a good coaching staff. It's a strong coaching staff. So, and he's a Bay Area native. I mean, do you, do you think that that plays in anything into him staying? The the fact that he was born and raised as as a Raider fan. No question about it. Anytime that you can have a coach that is not only knows what he's doing, he's a motivator, a culture changer, and just an all around good head coach and ex player that is a local native. I mean. The marketing there alone is just worth it. So I mean, he's he's carrying the whole package with him. He's you know he's local, great coach, ex-player, you know, great motivator. And the most important thing that I like about Jack Del Rio, and it's the key for me when it comes to head coaching, is his his ability to manage his staff, because that is so key. I mean, a lot of guys, yeah, they're great offensive minds, they're great defensive minds, but a lot of the times, you know, they want to focus on one and not the other and not be able to trust into his staff and just lead by example and just go to meetings and say, this is what I'm expecting, what do you got? And then, you know, just being able to manage. When you looked at Tony Sperano, Tony Sperano, I don't think Tony Sperano was much of a head coach as he was a manager of situations. A good one at that, but just managing situations, not necessarily coaching up. Jack Del Rio brings both. Managing the situation, he can manage Bill Musgrave, he can manage Ken Norton, and he could coach defense. So I liked the fact that he brought in even a guy like Mike Tice to even help him on the offensive side of the ball. So Jack Del Rio has all the pieces. That shows me that he's not only a good head coach, but a good team manager. And he's got all the right pieces in place because he understands what makes a good team. And that is a good coaching staff and being able to trust into that staff. So, you know, once again, Jack Del Rio is the man. And I see him getting an extension maybe by the end of this season. Yeah, absolutely. I think he's done some good things already, and he's shown that he's learned from his Jacksonville days. I mean, I, I don't think that this is a guy that just wants to pound the football and, and, and not put his defense in bad positions. He's, he's kind of shown that, hey, you know what? I'll take advantage of the strengths of my team. I, I will let Musgrave and Carr win us a game. You know, I, I'd, I'd love it for it to be my defense, but you know, if my defense isn't the best unit on the field, then it makes no sense for me to try to handicap the entire team. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think he's going to be a fixture here for a while. So, again, it's, it's an exciting time uh, to, to, to be a Raider fan. All right. Well, that wraps up our Q&A segment. We're going to go ahead and take a break. But when we return, we'll be talking about the state of the Raiders, the Coliseum edition, with our special guest, Zenny Abraham, as well as our own conversation regarding key issues that surround the stadium. Stay tuned. The Oakland Knight here. Wanted to remind you all that coming up, July 30th, 2016, San Buena Ventura Beach, Ventura, California, from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. will be the 8th annual Raider Nation Bonfire. So grab your friends, your family, and your booster clubs and head out to the beach for one Raider time. And make sure to subscribe to stay up to date to all Raider Nation events happening this summer. This message is brought to you by the Wheel to Win broadcast. We'll see you at the beach. Welcome back, folks. Tonight I am joined by Zenny Abraham. Mr. Abraham 
has served as an economic advisor to two mayors, as well as a consultant to several California redevelopment agencies. He's a popular newspaper columnist, as well as a producer of the blog report with Zenny62. As seen on many internet platforms, as well as national television. Thank you for joining us tonight. Zenny, welcome to The Will to Win. My first question for you tonight, Zenny, is could you share with the audience a little bit of your past and how it pertains to the city of Oakland and the stadium talks? Oh, wow. I started with the city of Oakland as an intern. Well, technically, uh, my first involvement with the city goes all the way back to, wow, 1979 when I was a junior becoming a senior at Skyline High School in Oakland, and I developed scratch a stadium that if it were actually built would have been twice the size of the Louisiana Superdome, what we now call the Mercedes-Benz Superdome. And uh, I thank Eugene Rockery for that. And then uh, I entered into a contest and I got an honorable mention for that. And then uh, I also entered into another contest where the winner had uh, where well, Entry, in, entrance, excuse me, were asked to come up with a design plan for Oakland City Hall Plaza. And so even though I didn't win, I came into honorable mention then, the zigzag pattern that you see at City Hall came directly from my plan. <laughs> and that's by the admission of Y. Haley, the architect, who was commissioned to come up with the plan that's there now. So uh, that was my first taste with the city of Oakland. Uh, other than that, I... Um, after that, as far as the Raiders, I was hired by the city as an intern in 19, uh, well, I was in grad school in 1986, and then I was hired again as an intern to come right out through grad school, and my first project, one of my first projects was something called the Coliseum Redevelopment Survey Area. I started the Oakland Alameda County Sports Commission from scratch. I started the Oakland Super Bowl 39 bidding committee, which I was the head. My next question for you tonight, Zenny, could you please tell us at this moment, who are the power players for the Raiders as far as getting a new stadium? Oakland, Vegas, Toronto, San Antonio? No, the major power players are all within Oakland. There aren't, I mean, look, I don't care what anybody wrote any place else. That's, well, that's garbage. The main power player here is Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff. The mayor power player here is Larry Reed, who is uh, chairman of the Joint Powers Authority. The main power player here is Scott McKibben, who is executive director. Why do I say that? The main power player is Mark Davis and Mark Bidet. Why? Because when you take away the fog, wipe all that crap away, the fact remains the Raiders are in Oakland. The other power player is NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. Those are the power players. They are the power players because the NFL wants the Raiders in Oakland. They've proven that. They've said it. They've given Oakland a number of chances over the past year and a half to keep the Raiders in Oakland. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell has an excellent relationship with Oakland Mayor Libby Schaaf, which was cemented November 13th of last year when Libby went to the NFL, gave an excellent presentation for the owners, and sold the owners that were in the finance committee on the growth track that the East Bay is on, its growing involvement in the tech sector, and then why it's the place the NFL wants to remain to be. A lot of people don't know this, but the Bay Area, which includes Oakland and the East Bay, and the South Bay and the North Bay and the West Bay, has, among NFL C's regions, the third highest cost per ratings point. In other words, if you want to buy time to air a uh, commercial in the Bay Area, it's going to cost you at least 10 times more than in Las Vegas. All that winds up in the pockets of the National Football League because its sponsors pay the NFL billions like ESPN and ABC Cap Cities to have that that the distinction of carrying the NFL games, they carry the NFL games, 
they sell their spot to advertisers. Those advertisers pay a premium. They benefit from it. So basically, moving the Raiders from Vegas, from uh, Oakland to Vegas is a loss for them. It's a complete loss. So all this garbage about Vegas really is just that. My last question for you tonight, Zenny, is, in your professional opinion, what are the odds that the Raiders stay in Oakland? Well, after my news today, which I've just released that Mark Davis met with Ronnie Lawton, now Marcus Allen is involved in the group for the first time uh, this week. I would, I pegged it for the first time we talked at 75%, now I say it's 80%. So yeah. this thing is rolling. It's, it's got tracks, and it's headed somewhere. Well, Zenny, on the behalf of the Will to Win broadcast team, we thank you for calling in tonight and giving your information. We look forward to future talks. Have a good night. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And, and, um, and subscribe, folks. All right, great stuff, partner. Okay, let's get down to some brass tacks here, shall we? Zenny really enlightened us on who exactly it is that's making the decisions and who the power players are. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the things that have happened in recent developments. Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff has been pretty vocal about her lack of enthusiasm for using taxpayer money to fund a new stadium. She said that we remain confident that the Raiders can build a new stadium in Oakland without direct public subsidy. And she wrote in January that basically her office that had initially declined to meet with the lot group during the early stages of its negotiations. So uh, I think my first question to you is that since she's downplayed the proposal to sort of keep the Raiders in Oakland, um, and she said more than once that she wouldn't speak to anyone about the 120-acre uh, um, project unless they were brought to her by the Raiders, uh, and also that she had asked city council um, to do it, uh, that Lot and, and the Lot and P group had reportedly met with her in recent weeks, as well as other team officials, uh, and that now, the San Francisco Chronicle was reporting that, I guess, Roger Goodell had, has had a phone conversation with her and that Libby Schaff now is regarding the Ronnie Lott and the Rodney Pete fronted Coliseum group as a very, very serious issue and that she will definitely be meeting with this group. In fact, she was quoted as saying that she was really encouraged with the team that they'd assembled and that her recent conversation with Roger the Dodger and others has given her confidence that she's willing to open up conversations. Um, so with Mark Davis committing to Vegas, is this too little too late? Or do you think that the lot group actually has a sluggish chance with the backing of the NFL after what, after what Zenny said? Well, in all my talks that I had with Zenny this week, he has become my major inside source. The man has a lot of connections and is a valuable resource, not only to the Raider Nation, but here to the will to win. So let me just start off by saying this. When it comes to Libby Shaft, Roger Goodell, and the Ronnie Lott group, all of those speculations are absolutely true. Roger Goodell backed Ronnie Lott in his investment group, and he also told Libby Shaft in a phone conversation that she should highly consider working with the group for they are formidable and have the income that she needs to actually get the proposal done. As far as Mark Davis and his push over to Vegas, it's just a simple ploy to just push the issue, just not for leverage purposes, but just for the fact that according to my source, Mark Davis does not treat the city as well as he should. A lot of the speculation has come from the Raider Nation, from groups like the 66 Mob, who are pushing for Mark Davis, as well as other groups, to actually sell the team. Mark Davis, however, will only sell a portion of the team where he sees fit to cover some of the costs to get the team to move. And according to Zenny, we are looking at Ronnie Lott and his investment group 
to be able to cover all the finances needed the same way that Stan Kroenke has in LA. So you think it's fair to say then that the Rodney Peak Group and the Ronnie Lott Group actually are, that they do have a really good chance here of being able to keep the team, but, you know, I mean, how does that play into what Mark Davis has already said about wanting to commit to Vegas? Well, according to Zenny, what was going on in Las Vegas was an extreme push to get everything lined up so they had something to stand on. From what I understand, the group that they developed over in Las Vegas to run the stadium portion of things over there in Vegas is separate from the actual city council of Vegas who actually just turned down the proposal of $750 million to $550 million. This whole time, Mark Davis and his investors in Vegas were trying to push the bonds process where it puts it all on Vegas with actually no money subsidies to back it up with. So basically they were trying to get control of public money that would be taxed to hotels just so they could go buy a property and land around the stadium. So it was basically a push to market themselves and fill up their pockets. And if anything went wrong, once again, the bonds on the city, not the NFL. That is not, now I'm not saying that it's the NFL's issue. This is a Mark Davis and his investors that he's working with in Vegas issue. So Mark Davis, once again, is just a small fish in a big pond. And what everybody needs to understand is that Mark Davis does not have the right to commit to anybody. At the end of the day, it's still up to the NFL and Roger Goodell to allow him to pack up his things and move. And according to Zenny, all signs are pointing that the NFL, Roger Goodell, want the Raiders to stay in Oakland. It is one of the largest markets in the, in the entire NFL right now, just falling shy and short of a town like LA. So they want a team in Oakland. They want a team in the Bay Area. And well, now that the Niners play in Santa Clara, the Raiders are the Bay Area. So it's something that they want to fully market. So even as Mark Davis wants to move, I don't see him getting out too easily. Well, there's been a lot of talk out there that the NFL has already pretty much shut Mark down, uh, that the Carson, the Carson project, uh, they basically took him all the way up to the 12th hour and then just kind of went in there and kind of shut him down. Um, he didn't fight that. He actually took it pretty graciously and, di and decided, you know, that he was going to go and look elsewhere. Do you think that this is the NFL again coming around and saying, look, we don't care where you want to go. We'll, we'll keep the door open for Vegas, but we're going to come and we're actually going to work against your best interest again and keep you in Oakland? Or do you think that Mark is actively in, involved in, in this process? Well, from everything that I gathered this week, Pirate, I do know this. I do believe that the NFL would like to put a franchise in Las Vegas, but I don't think they're necessarily sold on it being the Raiders. The Raiders, like I said, are in a top tier market in Oakland. And I believe that when Mark Davis was in LA for the meetings that just perspired and well, he got denied, I believe that all the talks about Vegas came up and that's when Mark decided he was gonna go on his venture and try Vegas himself. But now that we still don't know what's going on with San the San Diego Chargers, there's a good chance that the San Diego Chargers could be the team that moves to Vegas. And this is all, remember, pre-Ronnie Lott, Ronnie Pete investment group coming into the forefront in Oakland. And like I said, from reported by Zenny, Ronnie Lott, Ronnie Pete, and Edbert from the, uh, uh, the investment group that, in which that they work for, they have a total of up to eight banks that they're working with and it's reported that they have all the funds necessary to do what Stan Kroenke is doing in LA right there in Oakland, which means it will free the city of Oakland from the bonds. And that's exactly what Libby Schaff wants. And that should be exactly the way Mark Davis actually gets what he wants. So it's looking more and more like the Raiders are in Oakland to stay. But then again, there's a long ways to go and time will only tell. Well, with that being said, I mean, it, it seems like that, that it's a pretty done deal, but let's just say that it's not. Um, 
And just let's be the devil's advocate here. Los Angeles Mayor Carolyn Goodman has stated that the Raiders will come if Nevada handled the situation properly and that Mark Davis has assured her that Las Vegas is not getting played in a Raiders stadium type deal. And Goodman was also quoted as saying that she knew that she was going to have a team and that could be the Chargers like you were talking about. It's funny how they, you know, they, they, they just keep blocking the Raiders. Um, but what she said isn't so different from what Mayor Schaaf said when she was quoted as saying the city of Oakland remains firmly committed and is working on the terms to responsibly keep the Raiders in Oakland where uh, she wants them to be and where they belong. And that while she appreciated that the Raiders have uh, an internationally recognized brand that appeals to many different markets, that it was her job to remain focused on delivering a deal that works for the Raiders, the fans, and the taxpayers. Which means, again, she doesn't want to spend any money um, you know, from the city itself. But the question here is, with Mark Davis have, uh, spending so much time trying and failing to get a stadium done in Oakland, do you put the same weight in what both of these mayors is saying? And again, is it a totally moot point because this, the, the, the Lot Pete group basically has all the money necessary at this point to, to go forward? Um, if, I, are all the pieces in place that we can actually say for the first time Oakland might be the front runner, even though... Uh, Mayor Schaff and Oakland pretty much just kind of held their cards close to their vest. Is this a win-win for the Raiders, for the city, for the taxpayers, and for the fans? All signs are pointing to those exact scenarios. Now, let's keep in mind, all of this, in order for all of this to become reality, there's still a lot of things that have to happen. There's still the issue between city and county, as far as what to do with the property and how to divide it up, meaning should they sell the land to the investment group? Should they sell, should Alameda sell their share back to Oakland? So all of that is a big part of it as well. Then you have to take in consideration, yes, Ronnie Lott's group has the money, but is their plan, is their development plan on the same page of what Libby Schaff wants in Oakland? And then the third party in this whole thing would be Mark Davis, right? And he's actually the major one because he actually has a lot of standards he once met when it comes to the parking lot, the stadium itself, and its actual location on the property. So all these have to come together. So there's still a long road, but yes, all signs are pointed to the Raiders having the best shot for a stadium in Oakland. In fact, when I asked Zenny directly, what are the odds you think, what is the percentages you feel that the Raiders stay in Oakland. He says 66% being a guarantee, he gave it a 75%. So it's something that should pump up and make the Raider Nation feel good at this present time. But like I said, there's plenty of things that we have to look at moving forward. So it's not all set in stone and written and ruled that it's a done deal because Vegas is still in the mix. Now we gotta keep in mind, the NFL is really smart. The NFL is not just going to lay things on the table and walk away. I don't believe they want the Raiders there. I still believe that if Ronnie Lott and his investment group have the money, the NFL wants to see everything work out in Oakland beyond all reason, but Vegas is an option. And I think the only problem we have here is the mayor, on both mayors on both sides, they just have and want whatever they want, but the NFL is always still in control and they will determine where the Raiders go more than even where Mark decides they want to go. Well, I, I mean, that's great news as a fan. I mean, I think that that's, it, it is a fantastic scenario to actually have a group come forward and to be working with the city now uh, and to not have the taxpayers, like we were talking about at the beginning of this program, be responsible for this. But again, let's play devil's advocate here. Let's say out of nowhere, um, something, you know, happens and, and Vegas does have a chance. There was a video that surfaced on YouTube by the Support Las Vegas Dome Group. Um, and while we're not going to make you watch all of it, we wanted to include a clip here that we thought that you might find interesting. Let's go ahead and play that clip.
What's lacking is a professional sports team. Uh, and, and what's particularly lacking is the Las Vegas Raiders. I had a dream that someday I would build the finest organization in professional sports. When my father passed away and I took over, I feel like I'm the person that's carrying the torch forward, and then it's my responsibility to perpetuate his legacy. For the past six years, we've been trying to get a stadium done in Oakland, and then the opportunity of Las Vegas came to our attention. First off, the Raiders are undefeated in Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> to me, the Las Vegas Raiders are really the Oakland, San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, Las Vegas Raiders. Every team has an incredibly loyal fan base, whether it's the Raiders or the Green Bay Packers or the Chicago Bears. Together we can turn the silver state into the silver and black state. All right. Well, our fan base, while it may in fact be international, is also fiercely loyal. I mean, 13 seasons without making it to the playoffs I think can attest to that. I mean, we're selling out the stadium, right? And we're only now beginning to see the resurgence of a potentially quality winning franchise again. And while Los Angeles fans will remain as loyal as Oakland fans if they move, and if Mark Davis is, is right, can Las Vegas bring the Raiders from the South and the North together? Uh, and would it become the silver and black state? I mean, do you see the fan base being galvanized, not having to fight for control over North and Southern California, not having those traditional territory types of battles. Do you think that if, again, again, if something did come out of the blue and the Raiders were able to move, which signs are pointing to there at least being, like you said, a 60% chance of, of the Raiders still having an opportunity to stay, um, do you think that Nevada would galvanize the fan base and it would attract in people from both North and Southern California, as well as to create an epic, an economic boon, um, as a professional sports franchise in, in, uh, the entertainment capital of America? Well, I do believe that there's many different pieces to this. First and foremost, let's keep in mind it's obvious that the NFL listens to the fans, even when we don't know that they're really listening. So they understand that there was probably a lot of beef taking place between LA Raider Nation and Oakland Raider Nation last year. So Mark Davis feels that maybe going to Vegas could tie and build the bridges in between the entire Raider Nation and make it whole again. For many years, I mean, we started off a franchise that was developed with people like the Hells Angels, the Black Panthers, later to move to the county of LA and to the city of LA where in the late 80s, early 90s, the NWA and a whole other type of movement happened. To go, only to come back to Oakland where we carried a lot of the same mystique of the Hells Angels, the Black Panthers, and now also this NWA movement. So I look at it as the league, the NFL, and the Raiders, and especially the Raider Nation, with so many great booster clubs and fan bases around the league, Fans Against Violence, have done a great job of changing the culture in Oakland. And I think that Mark Davis needs to take this into consideration. I don't necessarily feel that just because we go into a whole new untapped area with an economic boom and a whole new market to uh, unleash ourselves on, that that necessarily changes or maintains the culture that we've built. Uh, I believe that there's been a lot of work done inside the city of Oakland when it comes to our fan base. I believe that Roger Goodell sees that as well, and I believe that's another reason why that Roger Goodell wants us to stay in Oakland. So for Mark Davis to make such a bold statement, you know, I love his passion and his respect and his ability to feel like, you know, this is possible for the Raider Nation and a good bridge to build. I don't see it being so cut and dry. Yeah, I think Mark talked a lot about the economic value and the potential economic boon, and several people did in, in that particular video. Um, but again, uh, just specifically as a fan base, there are questions of whether or not Los Angeles itself would be able to fill a coliseum. It was the same thing that happened with L.A., there are other things to do. If you're going to fly in, you can gamble, you can go and see shows, you can do this and that. Are you really going to be flying in specifically for a game? What are the ramifications of being in a, in a city like that that never sleeps? 
What do you th what are your thoughts on that, partner? I mean, you know, they do have a good core now. They do have a very solid core, good players, Derek Carr, Khalil Mack. I mean, just across the board, they've got a good coaching staff, I think. They're dedicated to what it is that they're doing. But in future generations, as we move forward, let's say, for example, and, I, and generation may be a, a big term, but in football, we're talking six, seven, eight years down the road. Is there the potential that this football team can lose a little bit of that chemistry and begin to, because of the environment, the free, you know, uh, lap dances and and the fact that the city never sleeps. I mean, it, you know, New York closes down at some point. Las Vegas never does. L.A. closes down. And even though certain bars you can keep going, I mean, it's that's just it is what it is in Las Vegas. So is there the chance that as we move forward, um, this fan base can change, that, that, that the team itself can change, and that uh, as we move down, the location itself may become a detriment to the actual uh, product that they put on the field? I believe it's a huge possibility, Pirate. I mean, when you look at the fact that Vegas never sleeps and you, know, you get adapted to your environment, and like I just got done stating, the league, the fan bases with all the booster clubs and organizations that work with the Raiders have done a tremendous job of changing the culture, not only outside the stadium, but when you bring in guys like Jack Del Rio and Reggie McKenzie, who've done a great job of drafting and molding these guys into men. Sure, I think that there's a good foundation for there to be some structure and control if we land in Vegas from, from players like Derek Carr and Khalil Mack and Amari Cooper. But those three guys out of a roster that pertains 53. So 53 men set loose in a city that never closes with the temptations all around them. Clubs basically offer them things for free to come be at their establishment. You know, money rules all in this world. And it's an unfortunate reality that we live with every single day. So as these players get paid millions and getting offered millions more for free, even around the environment around them, I believe that eventually that environment will start to swallow up our roster and you're going to start seeing players like, you know, maybe Alden Smith, if he's still on the roster with the temptations to, to take a backslide into some situations he just got himself out of, or maybe offering new type of situations for guys who are oblivious to it, like Amari Cooper, Khalil Mack and Derek Carr. A lot of these things could come back and just get them in a bad situation that they never intended to be in. So. I feel that, you know, even though Vegas is intriguing in so many different ways, and I've been quoted over the last month talking about these issues, the money and and all the, the other things that can come along with it marketing wise for the Raiders, you know, I will I'll be the first one to admit to sit here and say, I mean, I, I was should have been misquoted on a lot of that because, you know, in talking with guy like Zenny, who has a lot more connection to how government works and the economics of a city, you know, once again, Oakland is a better economic position in a better economic position right now than Vegas is. And we're, we're only ranked behind LA by just a, a small margin. So when you take everything in consideration when it comes to money, marketing, and just the fact that, you know, this, the league, the Raiders and the Raider Nation have worked so hard over the course of the last 20 years to rebuild this culture and foundation outside of O.co, it only makes sense that these, not only that we stay in Oakland, but that the league backs it. And that's exactly what I'm seeing right now. So it's, it's very interesting as we move forward to see how far this really goes. Yeah, I think it, it's certainly going to be interesting. I mean, you know, you take a look at it, and I think a team, like you said, takes on the personality of its owner. Sometimes a team will take on the personality of their coach, and sometimes a team is going to take on a, the personality of their environment. You take a look at the Pittsburgh Steelers. They've had a number of different coaches, but they've really always kind of been Pittsburgh. You take a look at uh, the Oakland Raiders, when they were in Oakland, they were a blue-collar type of football team. They went out there, they partied, they were they were hardworking, you know. But they laid it on the line. They went to Los Angeles. Yes, they won a Super Bowl there. But a lot of people will say they turned Hollywood. They basically turned Hollywood. Um, and when you start looking at Sin City. 
I mean, it starts to it starts to make you wonder if Mark really is understanding the ramifications. But again, we're, we're going to be sitting and talking with Zenny and and uh, finding out new things as they come up. But at least at this point, it's good to know that this is not a foregone conclusion. I, I watch a lot of other. Uh, listen to a lot of other podcasts, listen to people on the radio, and everybody seems to think it's a foregone conclusion. So I, for one, am extremely happy that there is the opportunity for us to kind of get out of this tailspin, uh, if you will, and potentially have the ability um, to, to put something together. And I, and I think that this really should be the model for, for the rest of the league. It's like I said at the beginning of the program, you know, we're being held over a barrel. We're being told that we have to do things that we don't want to do or we're incapable of doing by people that have more than enough resources to do the very things that they're sort of robbing us at gunpoint to do. Right. I mean, this is like you just said, it's going to take 500 million to get the Rams to to um, Los Angeles. You know, it's going to take another 500 million to get the Chargers to Los Angeles. It's going to take 500 million to get the Raiders to to Las Vegas. So even if we're talking about one billion dollar coliseums and you only look at the coliseums that actually need it or, or the facilities that actually need it, and there's only three or four around the league. The league has more than enough money just in these moves to be able to do something like that. So I think even though people want to attack the city, even though they want to say, you know, hey, what the heck's going on? Mark Davis has a point. It's it's a it's a worn down uh, venue that cannot host a Super Bowl structurally uh, in terms of its ability to just hold the amount of people that that even championship games um, might, uh, you know, bring in. Uh, it, you know, the, the plumbing, all kinds of different things are going wrong with it. It's not state of the art. So there are so many problems with it. So, so Mark's got a point, but Libby also has to be fiscally responsible to the community. Um, and let's face it, not everybody in Oakland is, is a Raider fan or a football fan. So this really, it kind of shows you that if you get the right people in the right positions and they can make the right types of deals, um, somebody like Mark Davis can get what he wants. An ownership group can can get in there and get what it is that they want. And the city, the county, and the fans can all get what they want. And that's that's for this marriage to stay in Oakland. So I just hope that, that they're able to, um, to figure something out. All right, folks. Well, that's our segment for tonight on the State of the Raiders, the Coliseum edition. We're going to go ahead and go out to break. And when we come back, we're going to go ahead and send it on over to Raider Lion as he breaks down a guy that I think the Raiders stole in the seventh round, Vidal Alexander. Excuse me. We'll be right back. <laughs> MMM Carpets is celebrating the holidays with a huge inventory clearance sale. We have the best prices and guaranteed installation. Why would you buy anywhere else? Whether you're looking for laminate, vinyl, carpet, tile, or wood, we have it all. Save up to 50% on selected items. Room size rugs, only $69. Visit MMM Carpets at one of our six Bay Area locations or call us at 1-800-355-4MMM. Okay, once again, let's send it across the pond. Max, the floor is yours. Vidal Alexander, who has been coveted with multiple awards, including all SEC and all freshman honors in both his junior, senior, and freshman season, was drafted by the Oakland Raiders in the seventh round of the 2016 NFL Draft. Mark Delgirian says that it's a very solid depth pick, and according to NFL.com, it was a very good value pick for the seventh round. And for the Oakland Raiders, they have added a new young player who's going to be able to compete not only now in his first year as a rookie, but in future years to come in the NFL. And potentially, he may even surprise a few people. Vidal Alexander was, uh, until even a couple of weeks before the draft, according to some people, a first to second round talent. At the start of the 2015 college campaign and season, he was rated by many people as a late first round pick. So it's surprising to me how he's fallen so significantly. 
It should be easily noted that his strengths are obvious. Ergo, his strength is one of his major strengths. He has been described, as I would probably describe him, a mammoth. A mammoth of a man who's able to tower above pretty much anybody he's going to be going up against. That's exactly what Jack Del Rio has been looking for and wants in his interior offensive lineman. Think about Kalichi Osamwele, how tall, strong and imposing he is. Derek Carr even noticed it when he came into the building. This is exactly what Vidal Alexandres and fits the bill with what Mike Tice wants for the, for the Raiders offensive line. He is a brilliant downhill blocker and is able to be a powerhouse in the run game and move people so that we are able to get a solid running game going. This means that potentially if an injury happened, as I do not envisage him to be in the starting team in his rookie year, he's going to be able to come in probably as the starting backup for a guard in the guard role and take on anybody in the run game and dominate them to hopefully means that Lotavius Murray will have a lot of success. This being said, it is noticeable on tape that he's able to cave in people with his down blocks and when he gets to the second level, linebackers are no match for him and it's multiple times you're able to see him ploughing over linebackers and pancaking them. This is where he basically dominates them and pushes anybody to the floor and probably sits on them. It's exactly what the Oakland Raiders have been looking for in a guard and Vidal Alexander they have found the perfect blend of strength, size and potentially a little bit of speed, especially in that short area burst of about 10 yards from the offensive line. Yet, his strengths can also be seen in the passing game. He's shown multiple times that he's able to play along all positions of the offensive line and dominate pass rushers. He's able to dominate them and use his strength in his legs to hold them and prevent them from getting any true pressure on the quarterback. As just mentioned, the versatility he's displayed and played at guard and tackle across his years at LSU is going to be another bonus and probably means that he'll be able to find a roster spot with the Oakland Raiders for the coming seasons, not only just during his rookie campaign. It was reported before the draft that many teams were intrigued by Alexander's size, length and speed combination, especially in short areas. And thus it was surprising to me how he fell to the 7th round, as I still had a very high grade in him, a 2nd to 3rd round grade. Thus, it is an exceptionally highly valuable pick that the Oakland Raiders have been able to achieve in the 7th round. And hopefully this guy should make the roster and do great things in years to come. I would even go as far to say that he will be above the depth chart on a 4th round pick rookie last year, John Feliciano who I believe will now be demoted to the second string guard or centre or tackle, as Valdal Alexander should prove to be a superior acquisition. Alexander has enough a notable power to win in one-on-one -on -one situations in the NFL. Yet, there is some problems at times with his athleticism, which means that over duration of a game, with stamina and tiredness and fatigue setting in, it means that his play may decrease significantly. This is the main reason why I think he fell to the 7th round and wasn't selected as highly as say the 3rd, 4th or 2nd or 3rd, 5th, 6th round. It could mean that the Oakland Raiders are going to have to work on him and means that he's possibly going to have to lose even further weight. As when he came into college and in his freshman and sophomore year he was reportedly close to 360 pounds. Even though he weighed in at 326 pounds, this is hardly ideal for some teams to play, who play guard. And you're going to be looking at more a 315 or 310 pound guard who can move, kick back and also play, get to the second level very easily. This rookie who is being honoured at every level of college football should earn a roster spot for the Oakland Raiders and should in time prove his worth and proved that he was definitely worthy of potentially even a second or third round pick. This I truly believe and in time he may even get into the starting lineup for the Oakland Raiders. Yet for now it's going to be interesting to see his development but I have high hopes for this rookie who has shown that he's able to play with the best and able to beat the best in one on one situations over his college years. <laughs> Well, folks, that's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed doing it for you, the Raider Nation. 
We'd like to end our show with an invitation to become a part of our community by joining us for our live 6.30 after show on YouTube. Please also remember to subscribe to this channel and to like us on Facebook as it means that you like our content and it will help us keep you up to date when our latest videos are released. Until next time, folks, live a life of passion and purpose on your terms. One Nation, First Nation, Raider Nation. Your commitment to excellence and your will to win will endure forever. You will magnificent. Let's go, boys. Let's go to do our thing now. The autumn wind is a pirate.